I'm Jeff Allen. I teach here in the writing program at the New School. Uh, this event is being done under the auspices of the Pan-African Literary Forum, which is an organization I founded a number of years ago with um, Arthur Flowers and Muhammad Ali, who was one of the readers tonight. Uh, the event is also being co-sponsored by Kavi Khanum, and we've had a very stellar relationship with them here at the New School's writing program. So the, um, the idea of the event was to, to present a number of black male authors of various generations and of various places in the world. Um, I guess I'll avoid the debate of why only males. You can ask about that at another time. But in any case, I should start by saying that we have a slight change in the lineup tonight. Uh, Sterling Plump was not able to attend, and Zakes Emda was not able to attend either, and Christian Campbell was set to come here and then got sick yesterday, so he, he is still in Toronto. Um, in any case, we still have five readers tonight. Uh, we'll begin with Karapetsi Kodasili, who was the National Poet Laureate of South Africa. Um, a writer who's published many books since the early 70s and who has taught and lived in many places in the world. Um, and among other things, he is presently on a national tour of the United States, which uh, was organized with the help of the Pan-African Literary Forum. And I should say, if he doesn't mind me saying so, he is a gentleman in his 70s and uh, he's been on tour since March the 10th and has to go into May the 2nd. So that in and of itself is impressive, right? So we can all take some pointers there. Um, but Professor Kodosili will be our first reader. Our second reader will be Tayemba Jess, the man in the hat, the second hat there, uh, who I'm sure needs no introduction. Tayemba is originally from Detroit but I met you in Chicago many years ago. Um, Tamba has published one book of poems, Lead Belly, which is just an amazing collection that was chosen for the National Poetry Series. And Tamba's presently, Tamba has won a, a numerous awards for his work, I should mention that, including the Whiting Writers Award, among others. Uh, and Tamba is presently teaching at the University of um, College, of College of Staten Island at CUNY. So I think all of us CUNY people want to kind of forget that, right? But it's another story. But anyway, uh, Taimba will be our second reader. You'll be reading from some new work, I believe, a, a book in progress. Our third reader will be Muhammad Nasihu Ali, who is there at the end. Uh, Muhammad is the author of a collection of stories, Prophet of Zongo Street. Muhammad was also a Kane Prize finalist for a short story that he published in the New Yorker. Muhammad, as well, was a, a writer at the Center for Scholars and Writers, where he began working on his first novel, um, which is still in progress. And he is presently teaching at NYU in the undergraduate writing program. I should also mention that Muhammad is a musician and singer whose music was featured in the film, I'm bad with titles, what's the name of that film again? The Visitor. The Visitor, uh -huh. okay, great. We should all see that if you haven't. So Muhammad will be our third reader. And then <clears throat> here on the end is Quincy Troop. I realize you gave me your bio, but I can, uh, which I misplaced, sorry. <laughs> Not my fault, man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Quincy needs no introduction anyway. Uh, <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> Just to say the name is enough. Right? <laughs> but uh, Quincy, as you all know, is a distinguished poet of numerous collections since the early 1970s. He's also edited many anthologies. Um, he is also the author or the co-author of, of um, Miles Davis's autobiography. And... Um, and he also is the co-author of The Pursuit of Happiness, which you all know was made into the movie with Will Smith. 
Um, presently, the, um, the Quin well, I should say Quincy published a memoir about his relationship with Miles Davis, which is called Miles and Me. And that movie, that has been made into a movie, which will be Not out. yet. Okay. It'll be shot this summer. Okay, so it'll be out uh, next year, I guess. Yeah. Uh, right, okay. Um, Quincy is, has a new collection out, which is called, I can never pronounce Aronsities. it. Aronsities. okay. And you can explain Easy. what that means later. <laughs> uh, he'll be, so he'll be reading from that tonight, I believe. So without further ado, I'm going to have um, Professor Codicilli come and get us started for tonight. Good evening, everyone. Okay. Uh, I hope you can see me. All of, promise, all of me is here in this business. Uh, Jeff had asked me to start off with some poem that I realize I don't have. So I'm sorry about that, too. So the first poem is called The Red Song. <clears throat> Need I remind anyone again that armed struggle is an act of love? I might break into song like the bluesman or troubadour, and from long distance, in no blue slab, I might say, baby, 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 there's no point in crying just because, just because I'm not at home. When I walk, when I try to run away from song, walking softly in the night, a persistent voice, more powerful than the enemy bombs, grabs me by the elbow of my heart, demanding the song that bathes our lives in the rain of our blood, stretched taut in the streets as Moloisi gasps the last breath of one solitary life. Should I now stop, of, stop singing of love, now that my memory is surrounded by blood? Sister, why? Or well, why do we at times mistake a pimple for a cancer? And you, brother, who knows our tough tale, who has been through the tunnel on this long road, who has seen the night winking and whispering, who possesses the worldwide hands of the worker who has created this house, these clothes, this bed, this street I walk in the night, this light to shatter the darkness of this despair, Tell me why I must not sing a song of love. Horror and terror are not strangers here. When Duma, no older than six years, looks at shoe prints in the yard and says, Papa, who has been here? Rangwane, Uncle Tammy, Uncle Tim, Uncle George, and you do not have shoes like this. Mama, why did you leave the window open? The child knows and tells something about the life we live. So who are they who say no, love, no more love poems? I want to sing a song of love for the woman who blasted the Boers out of that yard across the border and lived long enough to tell it. I want to sing a song of love for that woman who jumped fences pregnant and gave birth to a healthy child. I want to sing a song of love for that old woman who in fearful night still gave refuge to comrades. I want to sing a song of love for the peasant who shared his meager supper with comrades without returns for services rendered. So now, with my hands clasping guns, grenades, 
bombs, embracing the warmth of my woman's breast, moving to the rhythm of a mother's love and the sad, sad eye of a father, embraced in the fixed demands of a troubled and expectant people from the stench of history and the fragrance of desire and purpose. Softly I walk into the embrace of this fire that will ignite my song of love, my song of life. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you. Morning in Tunis. <clears throat> For Zueli and Katleho, my son and nephew in that order or their names. Mm. Of the paradise and glory of the never ever time of a place none can point at, no matter how many preachers are born, there will be no celebration of life except where memory collected and collective from then, now, and then guides us. Now, even though my children have never known peace, I would like the children of the world to see with their ear and sing the sunrise in Tunis. It is hot of watermelon red, mellow like an ember slice of moon as it emerges from high rock and low cloud suspended near the blueless sky, a spectre between nothing and nothing without a single ray of light as if simply to say, don't you know the world is remarkable? <clears throat> Etegwini. Uh, Etegwini is what uh, the English renamed Deben when they arrived in South Africa. But the indigenous people from there call it Etegwini as they've always called it except when they speak English. <laughs> it's dedicated to a Deza, dynamic younger poet from the Philippines. I plunge into language, hoping to emerge with the shout or whisper of the quiet and secret places my sister celebrates, the tender and blue flame of her voice moving us deep into all that we are or could be. Here we must jump to recreate ourselves where Keith Jarrett wants us. There's no way to practice jumping except by jumping. Like any child you know, I grow. When they ask me then, since I have been to these big waters here, how does the tree and water grow? Well, I know what to say. Here, amongst the sounds of the ocean, the river that moves like the dancer, and the hills whose back you must ride anywhere you want to go, I have met the whole world in motion like this ocean. Uh, Cassandra Wilson will sing. Let me sense the chaos. I will respond with a song. Why else was I born, says Jimmy of the Purple Haze through Kalamu Yasala. Now look at those eyes. Look at her arms. Follow her little finger. 
I wonder what Jean Tuma, who could see the Georgia pike growing out of a good path in Africa, would say about Cassandra Wilson tonight. Perhaps Cassandra does not even sing. Here, of course, a voice there is possessed by music like the rest of her. Her whole body is song. Her whole body has sensed the chaos. I say, look at those eyes. Look at her arms. Follow her little finger and understand perhaps why you were born with ears. For Johnny Jani. Johnny Jani was a bass player who died in exile, perhaps appropriately, on stage playing German. When I swim in my music, a hammerton of colors becomes an area of feeling where rainbow of feathers peoples all space dancing in my heart. Here, I do not even know what flowers pop out of my eye. I move without even touching air. Johnny, you take us out there where we gasp silently amidst a bombardment of sound in the spell of the witch doctor's son, where I cannot even ponder how a witch and a doctor paradox could be one entity. Your base, Johnny, pins nothing down. Your base rides on wave or height or rock or depth of crevice of sound to bathe us in music. And we are moved where we cannot even hear ourselves gasp. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this one is just called Kate. In the, in the course of struggle, there are many who fall, and sometimes their falling does not make sense, because when you think of someone very vibrant, life is dynamic and they are part of the energies of a liberation movement, but they die in something as ridiculous as a car accident. It does not make sense. Okay. Kate starts with a quotation from a J. Wright poem. And death is the reason to begin again without letting go, J. Wright. About longing and lament of a night when a limp-hearted moon leaks through this humid air, and you on the dressing table in little sister's room, little sister who, like you, neither knows nor remembers any drama of youth or exile, and your eye piercing follows every move we make like an eternal sentinel. Your death was an end of death, and here we begin again. My sister, forgive us our demand for the improbable, our longing for your presence here right now, though what happened on that treacherous road and day we know. Forgive us, for right now it is not you, but us shrouded in gloom. My sister, 
I could not come to see what remained of you. Even if I had dared, I couldn't whisk my way out of your eye any more than I could jump out of my skin. Even on the sixth day after that treacherous Saturday that whisked you away from us, I could not come to see what remained of you. Your spectre patrols my restless moments when I know I should be slitting fascist throats or poeting your determined purpose, but I bounce to impotence like a check foreign to you in your fashioning our future, I could not even whisk my way out of your eye any more than I could jump out of my skin. Not that it would have made a difference had your hasty death on the Morogoro Road been foretold. That was what you had to do, clearly, as a philosophical choice. A meeting, though at most of them there is not much more than platitude or pretension. Clothes for the children, though to this day most remain as naked as their young souls. So now you are gone. You had to take a final road not chosen by you. And finally, I came and I looked and I was chilled to numbness. A mouth full of cotton wool where your weighted smile used to be. Body all shrouded and deathly still. No missile from your tongue or eye which always demanded what and why. Later, when I wished for rain to come smother my impotent tears, Baba said, only the pillow knows the tears of a man. Now, like my sister's embrace across the treacherous waters and centuries, I want to put my mouth on paper. The poet in me wants to carve a monument in song, a simple song stronger than any granite wall, a song that says, Kate Malale is the people, but the poem won't come. Thank you. The last, thank you, thank you. The last very short poem I'll read is called Letter from Havana for Baby K. It's dedicated to my wife. A while back I said, with my little hand upon the tapestry of memory and my loin, leaning on the blues to find the voice. If loving you is wrong, I do not want to do right. Now, though I do not possess a thousand thundering voices like Mazisi, Kamtabuli, Wekunene, nor Chris Abani's mischievous courage, as I trace the shape of desire and longing, I wish I was a cartographer of dreams. But what I end up with is this stubborn question. Should I love my heart more? Because every time I miss you, that is where I find you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What's up, y'all? That was uh, that was fantastic. Um, kind of up here by by 
kind of like a mistake. <laughs> but I'm glad to be here anyway, especially with uh, Willie Kozicilli, who I met in Chicago, and this gentleman here, who is, uh, I, I'm pretty sure, was the first uh, was the first poet I ever actually went to a real poetry reading to see, <laughs> Quincy Troop. I always remember him his dreads going all over the place. It was fantastic. Okay, um, so I'm going to read a few. Um, uh, this one, I guess, will be. Uh, I, I wrote it before this, before the event, but I guess just the other day, the Supreme Court ruled that you can be strip searched for any arrest at all. So I'm going to dedicate this to that, as well as to HR 347, which essentially outlaws protest wherever the government wants it, wants to outlaw it and also to the National Defense Authorization Act, which was passed around New Year's Eve, and also to the renewal of the Patriot Act. Habeas corpus. <laughs> you have the body, ankle and hip, each parted lip and each hair, the body with its sweat-stained heat and its cough. The spleen and tongue of the body is yours, from navel to spine. You have the body. You have the body bundled like a fist, shuddered in darkness, bound, bloodied, under suspicion. You have the body blistered with accusation, hooded, blinded, manacled, maced. You have the body electrified, born unto the body of the, re of the republic, we stand in stress position. You have the body numbered, targeted, locked, firing sequence initiated, search warrant expired when you have the body expired, exploded, the body printing in the wedding party, in a car speeding through night, in the morning before prayer, trial held in the head of the soldier flying bodiless remote drone from his body. I am the body in this voice, in my silence, the body rots, the body unwilling to answer when you have the body and the blood on the body you have. The body, stretched and waterlogged, named and unnamed, foreign and domestic, accusation in the eye of the body plucked out. You have the body, shipped into concrete and photographed, stripped. You have the skull and the penis and the heart of the body. Each vulva and opening, the digital record of the body as it writhes. You have the body definitively, indefinitely, the body huddled in the shape of our body. The body you have is the body you have. You have the body. Make room for me in the safe house of the war. Give me space to spread myself on the secure floor of that cell, crouched on the concrete, surrounded by the flesh of the mighty fist that swallows us in its pink, throbbing darkness. Make room for me with my laptop images of Abu Ghraib and Baghdad, my internet explorer and Wi-Fi connection. I want to watch out from my space inside the biggest fist on the planet. I want to see what it looks like after the knuckle meets the mosque. I want to see what's left after the pounding of the flesh on the skull of the world. I want to sometimes peek between the fingers and witness our velocity. So please, reserve a space for me deep in the center of the, ca of the cage in the fist that beats and beats and beats until it is its own heart. Mercy. The war speaks at night with the lips of shredded children, with its brow of plastic and its fighter jet breath. And then it speaks at daybreak with the soft slur of money unfolding leaf upon leaf. It speaks between the news programs in the music of commercials, then sings in the voices of a national anthem 
It has a dirty coin jingle in its step. It has a hand of many lost hands, a palm of missing fingers, the stump of an arm that it lost reaching up to heaven, a foot that digs a trench for its dead. The war staggers forward, compelled, inexorable, ticking. It looks to me with its one eye of napalm and its one, one eye of ice, with its hair of fire and its nuclear heart. And yes, it is so human and so pitiful as it stands there waiting for my hand. It wants to know my answer. It wants to know how I intend to put it out of its misery. And I only want it to teach me how to kill. So I'm going to read uh, something a little different. Um, I was reading up on uh, Scott Joplin, who died here in New York. He died in a New York State mental hospital of syphilis. And the last stages of syphilis, you know, um, starts to affect your, yeah, it starts to affect your brain. It starts to affect your, your uh, motor, motor capabilities, et cetera. But I'm trying to, I'm trying to imagine what might have happened. So this is a mock interview with somebody that, uh, that well, I guess you'll find out who it is. Della Marie Jenkins, September 19th, 1924. What is your name? My name is Della Marie Jenkins. How did you come to know Mr. Joplin? Well, sir, I was a nurse at the New York State Mental Hospital. He was a patient, syphilis, slow, slow way to go. Must have had it for years because by the time he got to the hospital, he was barely moving. You know, funny thing is I didn't, know, didn't even know who he was till about two weeks after he came there. He didn't play much at all while I knew him. What were your duties with Mr. Joplin? Bathing, feeding, tending bed sores. Wasn't much to be done by that point, but dose him up and let him move on from this world. He didn't say much, moved very little, except when I would hold him up for bathing. He would try to play his scales on the bedside table. I would be wiping him down while he played rags on that invisible piano, all slow motion and stiff, all herky-jerky like a rusted up gadget. So far gone into his dreams, he didn't know much of whoever came to visit, but knew how to find middle C, knew how to grow something in his head nobody else could hear. Of course, that might have been the sickness talking, but there he was with music stuck all up in his hands, him trying to work it out all out before he left. How did he play? Like I said, he didn't play much except when he, when he was all feeble finger twitching in the air or on the table or on the wall or on his stretched out legs. But one last time, he played the real piano in the great room. I think it had been months since he touched a key. Really wasn't supposed to have him down there as he was terminal care and all, but did it matter? That's what I thought anyway. Man about to pass on over, he might as well have one last play. Wheeled him down there a few days before he passed. Let him sit in a wheelchair stacked up on pillows. Didn't do nothing for such a long time. Nothing but stare at the keys, his eyes all empty, like broken pails. But then he moved, a little. It was like watching raw sap coming out a tree. He was moving so slow, and when he hit that first note, it barely made a sound. By the end, he wasn't nothing but a tremble. What did he play? Well, sir, I must confess that I don't know all of those songs. Most I know is how he played, what it was sounding like. So at first he played pretty good, you know, like, like the kind of good you want to tell somebody about just right before you doze off. The kind of notes that come strong at first and then fade to the next till you wonder where you began and they end that. Then other times, he'd make me want to just look away. He'd look up from the keys and through. Through me, through the brook, brick and mortar war, through Manhattan, like he was looking out a window, wondering whether to jump. Half blind one second, sway headed like a newborn the next. And when he played like that, it was, well, old timey one minute, then all lovely terrible. 
like he had another life in the music, but he couldn't get it all the way out to save him in this one. Or like, like he was playing another language on the keys, begging us to hear it with him. And then sometimes playing all slow, like he wanted us to learn every note. And then other times he'd be frantic, digging through them black and whites, like he was looking for something he lost, what was left of himself. Was it ragtime? Yes, sir, it was ragtime, all right. And then it was just plain old raggedy. All stitched together, loose in some parts and painful tights in others. Heard a cakewalk in there, but then, he, then, he, then, he, then, he, then the walk started to lean too hard and got drunk off its own sway. Heard some spirituals, near my God to thee, most done toiling here, but they, they wore too much pride to be prayerful. Heard a hint of that new blue music, but he let the keys sing too free to be truly sorrowed. It was a true mix-up, sir. Don't know rightly how to feel after he stopped. Wasn't no way to know whether a man should just take his hat off his head or throw it up in the air. Whether a woman should put her hands together over and over or just hold them up to her mouth with a silent prayer. So we all just sat there and watched, silent. The sick, the dying, the nurses. We watched them crawl all over that keyboard like a beggar in the gutter and a king on the sauce. Watched him leave half his life spread across the keys till he left himself half dead. How long did he play? What's time got to do with it? <laughs> long enough, sir. Long enough. Okay, good evening. So we're going to have a little shift here from poetry to fiction. And I'm going to read from a short story that I just finished writing. After what? I started in 2008 in Ghana, while I was in residency at a Ken Price uh, workshop. And it's called Revolution. Early one morning during the waning days of the Hamatan in February of 1976, we awoke to the blaring sound of martial music on our radios. To many of us on Zango Street, the music was all too familiar. It was the music the soldiers played when they made a coup. Every now and then, the music was interrupted by a deep yet shaky male voice that repeated, attention, fellow countrymen and women. There was a military coup this morning, and the new Ghana Proletariat Revolutionary Council, NGPRC, has assumed full control of the castle and the national broadcasting network. We advise everybody to remain calm and to stay tuned for a speech by the leader of the revolution at 10 o'clock. Very few people on Zango Street had radios of their own, so by the time the clock said 9.30, we had gathered at Gado's Barber Shop and Malam Silas Tea Shop, the two places we knew for sure that a radio would be on. The barber shop was the hangout for the street's book-long types, folks like Ms. Rafiq and Dr. Aziz. They and their two known parties spend half the day reading Daily Graphic and listening to GBC, BBC, and The Voice of America, and then spend the other half arguing about the news. Pompous as ever, Dr. Aziz and his fellows never miss the opportunity to curse out our Zongolese lot. They even coin an adage for us, Zongo and the letter Z, backward ever, forward never. Yet, on a day like this, we set aside our disdain for the disdaining group at Gado Babas and deferred to Mr. Rafiq and Dr. Aziz, our one-eyed kings and the only individuals who could explain to us what the radio was saying about the new coup. Across the street from the barber shop was Malam Silly's tea shop, where the mood was as usual, boisterous. The children, enjoying an automatic holiday from the Catholic school and the madrasa, 
milled about the shop's entrance. They seemed excited in the way kids are when things, good or bad, happen to people. However, the spinsters and young men who mostly patronized Silly's tea shop had a worrisome look on their faces as they sipped their hard beverages, a change from the easygoing manner they usually carried about themselves. The dwarfish tea seller himself, known to readily engage in idle chatter, was noticeably silent, his mind obviously on the coup. At the barber shop, Mr. Rafiq seemed to have already figured out what the coup was all about. What is taking place is not an ordinary coup, my friends. This is a revolution, he said to his fellow two known friends. The Soviet people themselves staged this coup, and they handpicked the new leader, he added. But Dr. Aziz did not even allow the air to blow over Mr. Rafiq's statement before he counted with his own take. That can never be true, exclaimed the doctor. The white people of England, and not the Russians, are the ones in charge of this mutiny. I have no doubt that the British people have returned to colonizers all over again, and I hear. He placed his hands, right palm, his right <coughs> hand on his chest, fully supported. The non-regulars and regulars alike, mindful that Gado would not tolerate any mindless debate that morning, allowed Dr. Aziz's comments to go unchallenged. Now, Gado Abba himself was a serious man, tall, lanky, with a slight hunchback, and a curved mustache that stretched from one cheek to the other. At the shop's crowd, as the shop's crowd grew, Gado, notorious for his mood swings, announced a haircut moratorium <clears throat> until the new leader's speech was over. These are grim times, said the barber, waving a, a pair of scissors in the air. He returned to his chair and tilted his head towards the shop's rain-damaged plywood ceiling. He twisted his mustache in solemn <clears throat> silence as he continued to listen to the martial music. Right then, a shabbily dressed out-of-towner squeezed his body into the shop and proceeded to ask for a trim. Are you so stupid as to not realize the gravity of this day? Gado pounced on the man. With scissors dangling in his left hand, he chased out the villagers, screaming, idiot, I'll cut your ear, not your hair. <clears throat> he would do it too, many present admitted, as Gado was known to give bloody ear to kiss who wouldn't sit still during a haircut. By the way, even a small Peking on Zongo Street knew that the doctor title Dr. Aziz has slapped on his name was just for show. We all know that. Truth be told, Dr. Aziz spoke the best English on Zongo Street and even beyond, as some people swore. But the man didn't even know the way to Kwame Nkrumah University. He only finished secondary school. Still, most of us preferred his book longness to that of Mr. Rafiq, who, even though a middle school finisher, acted with the pompousness of a whole university graduate. <laughs> Meanwhile, in front of the mosque, Malam Imran, one of our many self-appointed spiritualists, <coughs> told a small gathering of his Taliban and the streets mendicants that the new coup was revealed to him in a Wahai the night before. By the way, Taliban here means student. That's the original meaning in Arabic. It's not violent terrorist. So the preacher says, this revolution we hear of today will not be around in two weeks. Swore the Boka in his usual soft-spoken manner. By Allah's grace, I give it a maximum. He paused, fixed his eyes on the deep cloudy skies, and then added, four weeks, inshallah. The students and beggars shook their heads up and down in the devotional manner of religious supplicants. Our street was located right in the heart of Kumasi, Ghana's second largest city. To our east was the Christian section of Roman Hill, to the west the secular and animist enclave of Ashtown, to the north the humongous Kumasi Central Market, said to be the largest open-air trading hub in all of West Africa. <coughs> Ours was a community that reaped the bliss of the ignorance it had sown. We hid behind our Hausa tongue, it being the language of trade across West Africa, and didn't see the need to either adopt the city's local tree or send our children to the English schools. The Quran had taught us that the life of this world is short and transitory, and that our purpose in life is to only fulfill the prophecy of the Day of Judgment. 
We therefore lived a day at a time, from hand to mouth, and adhered strictly to the only mantra we knew, inshallah. And with such entertaining residents as Surajo the Swindler, Hamdawan the ever jovial latrine man, Mansa BBC the Street's authoritative rumor monger, A. Hay and Mr. Brenner, our luminary lunatics, and lastly Dr. Aziz, with his big English creating one laughing matter after the other, we consoled ourselves with the ironic humor of our existence, and in so doing, masked the painful reality of our poverty, illiteracy, and disease. But that February 11th was not a day for humor. Neither was it a day for jollity. By the harshness of the morning's rising heat and by the white man's discordant music still blaring on, our, on the radio, we felt in our hearts and in our stomachs that something new and different was afoot and that the tranquil state of our lives was about to be altered forever. Two. A few minutes before 10 o'clock, the martial music stopped abruptly. For the next three minutes or so, all we heard was a scratchy noise and also what sounded like the voices of people arguing in the background. Everything and everybody, including the lizards that roamed the three crevices, bobbing their heads wantonly, froze in their tracks. After an eerie silence that lasted about two minutes, the voice of our new leader finally came on. <clears throat> Good morning, fellow comrades, countrymen and women. His voice, deep and hoarse, rocked the tiny speakers of our radio sets. I am speaking on behalf of the new Ghana Proletariat Revolutionary Council, continued the new leader. Because of how coups Often these soldiers stage coups. The voices of the men who announced them had long lost their shock effect on us. But something caught our attention in this one speech. And it was the tongue of the new leader, whose name we immediately understood to be Sergeant Leader. Even though he never mentioned it during the broadcast. His English sounded foreign in our ears. It sounded like an English man's English, or the tongue of someone who had lived overseas for a long, long time. We wondered if what Dr. Aziz has said was indeed true. We have taken power in order to give it back to you, the people. We took power this morning to correct the injustices that have been going on in this country since our independence. <laughs> Education is not meant for only one tribe. Affluence is not created for only one section of the population. The wealth of the nation must be shared and distributed equally among all the citizens of this country. Hey, this Chaliman means business, or we thought, clinging to every word in the speech. We're going to apply all the military might at our disposal, Sergeant Leader shouted, to stamp out the corruption that has infested the moral fiber of this nation, to usher in a new era of probity, accountability, and progress in this country. We looked askance at each other, and nodded our heads in agreement. This Chaliman means business well, well. Listening to Sergeant Leader's speech, thunderous and angry, you will swear by the Quran that Allah himself has sent him down to rescue Zongo Street, to lift us up, to give us the opportunities other tribes have enjoyed. As Sergeant Leader continued, an intermittent bang was heard in the background. This caused breaks in the radio transmission. We later learned it was the sound of Sergeant Leader's fist banging on the desk in front of him, an act that became the symbol of his revolutionary style. The speech took all but eight minutes, and before concluding, Sergeant Leader explained that some anti-revolutionary soldiers were still trying to make another coup to counter his coup, and that in order to stabilize the situation, a 6 to 6 curfew had been imposed nationwide until further notice. Wallahi tallahi, this man is a man of action, a man of the people, we cried. For a full minute after the speech, a deep silence engulfed Zongo Street. Then we suddenly heard a loud roar coming from every corner of the city. Next, we saw a massive crowd numbering in the hundreds, maybe even thousands, marching toward our street. Taxi and trotro drivers blitzed their horns. Women waved their veils in the air. Power to the people, cried the young men and women. 
the university students sang, Ye aluta, ye aluta, ye aluta, continua, continua. We join all these folks, sang their songs over and over, though the real meaning of the words wasn't clear to many of us. And just as other communities did, we too joined the throng when they reached our street. We marched to Justice Park, where it looked as if a huge rally was about to begin. We realized much later that the march was not organized by anybody in particular, and that it had arisen from the spontaneous giddiness that had followed Sergeant Lee's speech. All day we hung about the dusty and treeless park and waited for the speech of nobody in particular. By late afternoon, the scene resembled a carnival. The city's food hawkers and water and fruit and juice vendors, always on the lookout for large gatherings, had their cars and trays planted all over the park's perimeter. Tricksters, magicians, aphrodisiac peddlers, quack gonorrhea doctors, and box cinema operators all got wind of the march. And within the blink of an eye, they too had put up shops with their rickety umbrellas. In our heightened, intoxicated state of celebration, we forgot the passage of time. The racy beat of the songs of struggle and revolution confused the cautious drumbeat of old that had always guided our actions. And we lost track of the rhythm of our biological clocks. By the time we realized it was nine minutes before six o'clock, someone from our street shouted, It was time to vamoose. It was curfew time. The moment we started running, others in the crowd quickly sensed their folly too and joined us in flight. An instant stampede ensued. People ran helter-skelter, stepping over one another and screaming in their various languages and dialects. The scene resembled the way the fall of Babel Tower was described in the Bible. Luckily for us Zongolese, our street was only five minutes from the park, and we made it into the safety of our houses just before the siren. But the story was not the same for the people of Ashtown, AEB, Asafo, and Bantama, where the majority of the marchers came from. At the first cry of the siren, hundreds of gun-carrying soldiers emerged from nowhere, Excuse me. as if they had lain in wait the whole time to attack the crowd at the strike of six. Through the cracks in our windows, we watched as the stranded marchers were beaten to the ground, some were even shot dead. Many of them dashed into compounds in which they knew nobody to seek refuge. We hid them in our houses and gave them mats to spread in our courtyards where they slept. Deep into the night, we heard sounds of gunshots and mortar shells from the five corners of the city. By daylight, we heard that over 50 people were dead. At least that was the figure Mansa BBC gave us. Other sources pegged the number of those killed at only two dozen. But since none of the daily newspapers made mention of the march, and the attack that followed, we had no means of knowing the actual number of people murdered on the first night of the revolution. And the rally that never was ended up being a bad dream in our heads. Okay. Thank you. How y'all doing? I want to get, dedicate this uh, reading to my uh, mother, who is uh, visiting me from St. Louis. <laughs> and uh, my wife, who's sitting right there. <laughs> um, this is an odd poem. I'm just going to read this first this poem, uh, because I was writing this poem, and uh, I lost the first part a long time ago, and uh, I found it later. So I'm going to read. It's called Las Cruces, New Mexico Revisited. And um, it's, about, it's about going out to Las Cruces and being with the Native American Indians, the Native people, because we have Native blood and African blood running through uh, my family. You know, I can't speak for everybody else. <laughs> so this poem is called Las Cruces, New Mexico Revisited. And the first part is the, is the part I found 
that was lost, and I'll read the rest of it. You have come to this space of light and pure beauty, from the love song tongues of ancestors sing, ringing. You have risen from an earth soaked in human blood, animal blood, bird blood, fish blood, slicking polluted water, singing the gospel. You have bloomed like a desert flower under the cross of crucifixion, your pain deep as poetry, river deep pure as love flowing back to Jordan, blood holy from Africa, you have come reborn to us. With the spirit of healing, you cleanse us now, baptize us in clear water of your sun warm words, and you have carried the holy flame of God through stone rain, kept it burning like a candle in the church of your heart. And you have kept the faith with your holy gods, with Jesus, with Malcolm, with Martin Luther King and every man. And you have come wearing the mantle of Adam, your own sermon on the mount in your own throat. O oh, gentle native man, luminous with tenderness, your commitment, your faith in love is so very holy, beautiful here, as the spirit of ancestors tonguing through your blood, their pain veining river deep through your gospel of holy feathers, your sacred texts of healing, deep singing in your sacred mountains, your sermons bringing us here to this clear sweetness of place, to this face this moment where you are light and beauty your words drum scripts we see in your dance steps carried in hearts throughout the world where you live too I have come here to these sacred great mesas high up above Las Cruces to sit med me mediate Meditate on this land flat as Vegas gambling tables. Rock hard as red dust swirls into miniature tornadoes. Dancing down roads red with silence as the faces of solitary Indians here where white men quick trick their way to power with hidden agendas of bullets and schemes of false treaties and black men alone here in this stark high place of mesquite bushes, white sand mountains, colors snapped in incredible beauty, eyes walking down vivid sunsets, livid purple scars slashing volcanic rock, tomahawking language, scalping this ruptured space of forgotten teepees. So I listened to a coyote wind howling and yapping across the cactus, dry high vistas, kicking up skirts of red dirt at the rear end of quiet houses, squatting like dark frogs and crows, its silhouettes high on live wires, popping speech call cawing in the sand blasted wind stroke trees call cawing all over the Mesilla Valley. And here, along the Rio Grande River, dry, parched tongue bed, snaking mud, cracked and damp north in the throat of Albuquerque. Mescalara, Zuni, Apache, and a Navajo live here. Scratch out their firewater breath, peyote secret eyes roaming up and down these gaming table mesas, their memories dragging chains through these Red breathing streets while Geronimo's raging ghosts haunts their lives with what they did not do. Stretching this death strewn history back to promises and hope a hole in the sky. A red omen moon where death ran through like water world pulling down a sink. And this shaman moon, a red target of light at the end of a tunnel of blackness where a train speeds through now. Towing breakneck flights of light where daybreak sits wrapped like a blanket around a quiet ancient Navajo wrapped in American colors who sits meditating these scorched white sands, flat distant high mesas shaped like royal basutu hats, chili peppers, curls, churls, pecan groves, road runners, chaparral birds, salt cedars sprouting parasitic along bone white ditches bordering riverbeds thirsting for water meditates these wide flat 
black lava rocks holding strange imprints of fossilized speech that died before it knew what hit it, as did these old silent red clay-spaced ancestors of this solitary Navajo sitting here, wrapped in breaking colors, bursting sunlight, meditating the lay of this enchanting blues land, changing its face every mile or so. And in their faces, Indians carry the sadness of ancestors who wish they had listened to those long gone flaming words, battle cries, Geronimo, whose screaming ghost prowls these bloody, muddy streets, baked dry now by the flaming eye, torching the sky. Wish they had listened instead of chaining his message in, the, in these coyote howling winds, kicking up skirts of dirt whose language yaps like toothless old men and women squatting at the rear end of quiet houses whose lights dance slack at midnight, grow black and silent as death's worn out breath. Beneath these pipe organ mountains, bishops peak caps, holding incredible silence here in the Mesilla Valley, where the Rio Grande River runs dry, its thirsty spirit damned north in the throat of Albuquerque, at the crossroads of fusion and silence, in the red gush swirls, whispering litanies, saw blading through rib cages, dust memories, snaking winds, tonguing over the Mesilla Valley, brings back long gone words of Geronimo haunting Las Cruces, New Mexico, long gone wind whispering, Geronimo, 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 Geronimo. I want to read a couple, three more, two, three more, and then sit down. <laughs> These are all from my new book, and um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me read this one. A poem of return, circa two thousand and eight. One. There is something sounding like the ringing of bells when you arrive. It's music clear in your heart. You feel the cleansing beauty of its wondrous tone rinsing through your weary body, carrying rivers of memories, sweeping over the familiar landscape until you come to the beloved place, the small house where so many moments are cascading waterfalls, moments shimmeringly green as Guadalupean mango trees or green after clouds drop buckets of rain, after the sun dry rises bright, clearing the darkness with its brooms of gigantic mystical beams of light flashing radiant. And you are there once again inside your head where everything seems serene in its place. Memories are seductive things beckoning you back to the young women you knew. As you grow older, their firm, lissome bodies ripple with perfection in memory, evoke volcanic desires. As you wake up next to your wonderful sleeping wife, holding your body firm, her tenderness, a bell ringing, beautiful as any you have ever heard, a waterfall of spirits cascading through serenading songs of wind chimes, reminds you of a very deep space that always springs alive in her gripping from the very moment you kissed her so many moons ago she holds still holds you there even now in her warm magical place of voodoo her deep suction pool of sweet love even while she is sleeping too there are moments within moments when you find yourself feeling at home as in a smiling face of a stranger walking a road in St. Felix, Guadeloupe, on the boulevard, St. Michel in Paris, where you see an old black man beautifully dressed in white linen, a red boutonniere in his buttonhole, starched white shirt. 
red tie, a gold tooth flashing like a razor in the front of his mouth, underneath a wire mustache, sporting snappy two-tone shoes, a bowler hat, and a silver cane counting off the beat of his hip stroll, two sleek beautiful women strutting beside him, arm in arm, dressed to the nines, their four pointy breasts are invitations, like the stilato nipples of the women in Wilfredo Lamb's surreal drawings and powerful paintings. The three of them, seductive, remind me of brash men and women I saw way back in childhood in St. Louis, Missouri, in the good old heydays of the 40s and 50s, when the Riviera and Peacock Alley were jumping clubs in high gear with wondrously hypnotic people, high-stepping it through, galvanizing, innovative music, pulsating clean to the bone of rhythms, when everything about being hip then was about style and timing, the promise of new days emanating, silver breaking from everyone's eyes, bright as scales of fish glinting, glinting sparks when sunlight or moonlight glances off its back as it swam close to the surface of the Mississippi River before the stainless steel arch rose like an Indian bow bent to its limit ready to send an invisible arrow flying true into the heart of America's tortured soul. I hear crows call cawing now in the gray feeded air blanketing the river's slow crawl through muddy slime see pollution in the form of oil slick snaking toward the choking mouth at the Gulf of Mexico where future Katrinas are waiting to scream ashore in the soon coming future unleashing howling banshee winds and boiling water beyond anything even the most cynical had ever imagined 37 years after John F. Kennedy came preaching the fresh, visionary good news at his inaugural, evoking dreams seemingly on the verge of really happening before assassination swept the giddiness away. John F.'s brains blown out in a motorcade in Dallas on a cold November day, 35 years before Martin was gone, like a wilted flower in Memphis, two years before Malcolm was snuffed out in New York City, five years before Robert Kennedy in Los Angeles, California, too many others to mention here, before vultures flopped down slowly from blue notes of storms weeping all all over schizophrenic America, land of the troubled, mocking the millions, unfree. Still, great American music inspired many of us with Obama to move forward into a new moment with gusto. We heard again the genius melodies, memory uh, memorable as moonwalks sashaying through the air in the strut of Barack's language, so original it began to spread like a great vintage wine everywhere. You could hear its intoxicating rhythms, its matchless vigor, its Miles Davis Eli its coolness. We thought the nation had entered a new age, but we were wrong. I was telling some people the other day that a lot of young people are experiencing now with, through Trayvon Martin, their Emmett Till moment in this country. It's true. It's true, because I remember when Emmett Till was killed and I was a young guy in St. Louis and we were outraged, you know? We were just outraged. And we didn't think that was gonna happen, you know, like that again. And I've known a lot because I taught on the university level for 34 years. And a lot of people say, oh, it's going to be better. It's going to be better. And it never has gotten better, really. But we just fooled ourselves into thinking it was or is or trying to get better. A vision. The star speeding across a midnight sky is a voice in the shape of a glittering comet. A bird burning as if it were pulsating with a need of sex as are these words carrying a primal scream, hot and dripping with longing. 
the star speeding across a midnight sky is a voice in the shape of a glittering bird burning as if it were a comet pulsating with the need to explode. These last two. <laughs> searching for a word for Margaret I am searching for a word skipping around inside my head it darts into corners escaping each time I reach for it it moves beyond the length of my tongue, my lips forming the shape of the sound where the word lives inside one sound. A single syllabic movement pushes my tongue up and down. Inside my mouth becomes almost a clucking sound when the word begins birthing, forming a singular moment. It becomes familiar as it shapes itself into a living word. Coming back closer to me now, the sound growing out of its womb, easing out of my open pursed lips as if about to kiss her, comes the sensuous word, love. Just think about it. Just think about it. Sometimes all you need do is open a door. Walk through it, perhaps, out into open space. Walk into the world, whether it's cold or warm. Then go whatever direction your mind of erroncities takes you. Go quickly or slowly, but move resolutely through this moment with your eyes wide open, your wandering brain, but move forward towards something perhaps you haven't thought to do before. Whatever it is, let there be beauty in it spreading light, meaning open yourself up to new music, people, vistas, spontaneous improvisations of the day, rhythms carrying possibilities to unlock secrets of this moment, perhaps will lead you to look into things, people you never focused on before you walk through the door. Perhaps the opening will reveal its yourself to yourself. Revelation, perhaps now you might feel different for the rest of your life. Thank you. Just to thank all of the writers, I uh, should say that there are books for sale in the back if anyone wants to purchase. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.